Hello, hi Alessandra. <laughs> it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Ogliari, who is um, at the University of Milan in CPR, and she is the last speaker of our series this summer. Uh, so I think we've done seven of these uh, to kind of greet, meet, um, listen to our new colleagues at CPR. Maybe in the future uh, we'll continue um, despite the Zoom fatigue. Uh, maybe things will settle. But anyway, uh, without further ado, Laura, you have one hour, including questions. Thank you. Uh, I will share my screen. There you go. You should be able to see my screen now. So since we are few, I will be extremely honest with you. Uh, I'm actually presenting a paper that is not an international trade paper. Maybe that's why so few tune in, or maybe it's the warmth, but I don't know. So I'm presenting this paper, which is a very, very much a work in progress uh, with Massimo Morelli. And I chose to present this one because we are in a stage in which we kind of try to finish the first part of building the data set and we want to launch in the second phase, which is really analyzing the data. But since we had to make a lot of judgment costs in building this data set, I really wanted feedback from guys that are usually um, used to work with empirics, empirical data to you know, tell me how credible it is uh, our data construction. So uh, please, whatever comments, idea, whatever comes up to your mind, even if this is not your field of research, please just say it to me and you know, I have paper and pen to take a lot of notes, hopefully. So as I was saying, this is caught with Massimo Morelli in Bocconi and Long Long, Long, Long which is a PhD candidate um, with funds in Madison, so it's going to be on the market this year. Let me see. So international, this is an international relationship paper, so we are talking about conflict. And usually when we think about conflict, the idea of you know, balance of power, preponderance of power, which is more conducive of peace, comes to mind. And generally, when we think about these topics, we have in mind military power, military capability. Also, recent literature, though, has shown that exclusion from political power inside the country may be conducive of civil conflict. So we kind of try to put these pieces together and ask a question, and ask a question that is, does power mismatch, meaning the imbalance between different dimensions of power matter for conflict? And I will be uh, clearer on that. So Massimo has a theory paper, full-fledged theory paper on this topic. And we kind of try to want to bring this theory to the data. So let me just paint with a couple of strokes a toy model uh, so that we are all on the same page to show you where the prediction comes from and why this mismatch could be important. So consider a country which is populated by two groups, a dominant group, a government group, group G, and a rebel group, R, which has to consider whether to rebel or not. So if it does not rebel, it enjoys the status quo payoff, which depends on P, right? The share of the surplus that he enjoys with peace. Sorry. Um, instead, let's call M the probability uh, that the rebel group has to win a conflict if he enters into a conflict with the government group. If he wins the conflict, he will enjoy the whole, the whole surplus, which we normalize to one for simplicity. Uh, let's instead call C the symmetric cost of conflict. So simply, the expected utility, the value of going to conflict is going to be M minus C. So the probability of winning a conflict times the surplus minus the cost of war. Instead, if it does not wage conflict, it's going to enjoy P. So it will enter to conflict, it will initiate a conflict if the cost of war is small enough. So it's small than the, smaller than the difference between M and P. Symmetrically, we can expect the government group to attack, to initiate the conflicts um, if its probability of winning against the rebel group, against the other group is high enough. And since the data are not going to allow us to distinguish between who is, sorry, that do not allow us to distinguish who is initiating the conflict, 
we are going just to observe conflict. And so we should expect conflict to be more probable when the absolute value of the difference between M and P, military and political power, is high. So that's what Massimo in his research calls power mismatch. So the intuition here is that if a group is, let's say, rich and also military strong, it does not have any incentive to attack a group that is weak from a military perspective and also poor. The conflict, we are gonna, we are gonna serve conflict when we have on the one hand, a strong group which has low political power and on the other end, a group with high political power which has low strength. Everything, when we cast it to, in, to the data is gonna be relative, right? So we are going to build measures that are, that try to capture relative political power, meaning political power of the group relative to the dominant group and relative, relative military power of the group relative to the government group. So- Laura. Quick question, because that may matter for our interpretation and our suggestions for data. Why would the dominant group attack if it is already dominant? Or is this just like a per period cost of continuing the dominance? How should we interpret that? So I think it's more, a, so let me say two answers. So on the one hand, it could be a sort of repression conflict in which you want to kind of want to exclude a group from power. But in a model that is more complete, which is multi-period, it could also be a preemptive conflict, in which you don't want the other group to wage conflict and gain power as a result. So the, the model, that the, the toy model is really a toy model that I show is just you know, one, a one-shot game and there is no dynamics, but in a dynamic model with bargaining, it's gonna be more complex. But the idea is always the same, right? If there are asymmetries of power, we should expect conflict. So as I was mentioning before, we want to bring this to the data. And that's why now I'm gonna turn into the description of our data set and how we built a data set that, tries, that allows us to test this theory. So to do that, I need to describe, we have to make a lot of judgment call and I need to describe a lot of steps. So first we need to decide the actors, who are the relevant actors that take this decision of going to conflict or not. And I'm gonna tell you a couple of words about the dependent variable. And let me not spoil the rest. <laughs> so let's start with the relevant players. So we had two big choices. So we could test it either on international conflict, in interstate conflict, or on civil conflict. And as the label I as the label I gave to the model suggests, we are using civil conflict. And that is because there are many compared. So conflict is in general a tail event, but compared to interstate conflict, the, the, the numerosity of civil conflict is higher. And this is gonna be fundamental for us when we try then to estimate military power. Once we chose to go on civil conflict, we need to decide which civil conflict. And since we, we need data to estimate military power, we turn to ethnic conflict. So the actors in our database are gonna be ethnic groups. And to make sure that ethnicity is actually a relevant cleavage, we are going to focus on Africa, on, Africa, on the African group, because we know that ethnicity is still very important for Africa. Once we chose that, we need to choose which list of ethnic groups to use. There are multiple lists of ethnic groups, the majority of which is based on differences in languages. Um, we decided to go with the ethnic power relation database that is managed by the ETH uh, Zurich because it defines ethnic groups along those ethnic lines that are represented in um, national politics. So they have a list of what they consider politically relevant group. So the decision is made by expert in that country. So we are not actually doing anything. We are like keep uh, taking the list from what they say are expert and it's widely used in this literature. So we decided to go with this list. Importantly, they provide also um, measures of political power of that group. And that will be clear in a couple of slides. Uh, also, importantly, they give us the 
polygons where the ethnic homeland of these groups are located. And we are going to use them because they're gonna be, there's going to be a lot of geomatching in how we construct the database. So it's important to have the location of these ethnic groups. A caveat that we need to keep in mind, though, is that being a politically relevant group may change over time. So, for example, in Congo, there are these two ethnicities, which are the Luba and the Shaba. And for the first years in the data set, they are considered separately. So you have one group that is Luba and one other that is Shaba. But then after the 2000, they are considered as, a one, as one ethnic group. They are the Luba Shaba. Right? So the identity of the group may change through the data set. So if there are no questions on this, I will launch to the, um, in the dependence variable. So as a source of conflict, we are going to use the UCDP georeference event data set, which includes all events that include, that have the use of uh, armed force, that have at least one of the two sides is an organized actor, so either a government or a rebel group, and result at least in one direct death. We like that this data set for a couple of different reasons. So first, again, we need the location of the contact and there is precise location of the events. This data set is one of the few that provides the fatality borne by each side, which we are going to use later on. And also includes smaller events. So the majority of conflict data set just have events that have above 25 deaths. But sometimes political riots may also involve like smaller kinds of type of events and we don't want to a priori exclude them. To try to match it to the theory, we are going to consider only conflict that involved on the one side, the government and on the other side, a rebel group. So let me just screenshot of the data on conflict. So there we have one variable that gives us the type of violence. So we are going to use type of violence number one, which is government against the group, right? We have the two sides, size location of where it happened, and the estimates of that. We are not going to use violence against civilians or um, rebel group to rebel group conflict. As you may um, infer from this screenshot, we don't have information about the ethnicity of, of anything here. So in the next step, I need to show you how I attach the ethnicity of the ethnicity to the government group to the rebel group. And I will start with the government group. <coughs> Sorry. So the ethnic rela power relation data sets contain a variable that is called power rank. It's a variable that is ranked is from that ranges from one to seven. It is an index. So if the power rank is seven or six, so the group rules alone. It is monopoly of power or dominance of power. If the power rank is five, five and four, the group shares power. This is they label five senior partner in the government, four junior partner in the government, and groups from three one are excluded from power. It's a weird category that they call self-exclusion. So these are groups that have autonomy and uh, do have political power at the local level, but decide not to participate in the national politics. When I talk about power here, I talk about executive power. Okay. Laura, is this, sorry, I missed that part. Did you receive this data or did you build this data? This data, no, this is public data from the ATH Zurich Conflict Research um, Center. Right? Okay. So and we, we didn't do any judgment call here. So we take this so data and now like we, we are trying to use this variable to attach an ethnicity to the government of the country, right? Because in the conflict data, we see government of Algeria and they want to attach an ethnicity to that government. So there is just one group that has the highest rank, which is the rules alone of so shared powers, but is the biggest one, the one with most power, I'm gonna attach that ethnicity to the government. There are a few cases. So let's say 40% of the groups in my data set 
have in, so in the count, so yes, in the, of the observation have um, the dominant group as either a six or a seven. It, this is easy, right? I have the dominant group that ethnicity is dominant and I'm attaching it to the government group. There are also 30% of cases in which the highest rank that I get is five, which means that either there are other groups that have four, but there also could be multiple groups that have five. So if there is just one five, again, the highest rank is the government group. If there are multiple groups that have five, what we try to do is do manual checks. So if they are allied, then I consider them as one, on, one entity, which means that when I'm gonna have variable like nightlife population, whatever, I'm gonna aggregate the variables of the two groups and consider them as one entity. If they are not allied, we try to understand reading newspapers and articles, but international because we don't know the language, if we can assign, we, we, can, we can tell which one is the, do, the real dominant one, for example, say the ethnicity of the prime minister, stuff like this. If we cannot, we just drop that observation, which in this case means dropping the whole country for those years in which we have multiple fives that we cannot attribute, that we cannot say whether they behave together or not. This, that, this happens a couple of times. <laughs> So the easy part with the dominant group is let's say it's done. Now we have a more difficult task, which is to give ethnicity to rebel groups. So we want to use geomatching uh, as previous literature has done before, but we cannot really use a simple version of this geomatching. So the first thing we do is, again, rely on the work of political scientists. They have a cross table that attributes some conflict of the UCDP to ethnic groups. So we start from that. What, whatever they say, it belongs, it's a conflict of that ethnic group, we attribute. But there are many, much, many more conflicts in our database that we cannot attribute with their simple correlation. First of all, because they only attribute big conflict. So what we do, we want to use geomatching, but we cannot do it in a simple way. So what previous paper have, let me show it with picture. What previous paper have done is to attribute a conflict, the ethnic group within which uh, border the conflict was falling. So here you have a picture of Liberia. Liberia, I have five ethnic groups. The orange one is the dominant group, the American Liberia. And then there are other four groups, Mandingo, Mano, Zio and Kram. Sorry. Okay. And then there are this, this big chunk of country which is populated by what the EPR data sets call irrelevant group. So these are groups that are not represented in the national politics. So they are neither powerless or discriminated against, nor share power. So Previously, what they were doing is that, okay, an event falls in the Mandingo, I'm going to attribute this event to the Mandingo. These events fall into the Joe territory, I'm going to attribute this event to the Joe. You see, all the events that I'm putting involve this rebel group, the Liberians United for Reconciliation and Democracy. So what happens if I do the simple, the naive geomatching is that I'm attributing the same, so the same conflict, same rebel group, different ethnicity, depending on where the conflict lies. So what we decided to do was to, okay, put all the events in which the rebel group is involved, eliminate the events that fall either in the, in the irrelevant groups or in the dominant group, because the event that fall in the dominant so group cannot be in conflict with himself. And with the remaining event, attribute to this rebel group, the ethnicity that contains the greater number of events. So in this case, 13 events fall in the Mandingo territory, four events in the Mano, seven in the Geo, and four in the Khan. So I'm attributing the word to the Mandingo. 
Of course, I chose an example that worked <laughs> in this presentation. So in this case, LUD, it's really, uh, it really is affiliated with Mandingo. Uh, but uh, this is what we do for all African context and African ethnic groups. So we did a couple of uh, ro manual robustness check. Uh, we did the, the old robustness check, manual check with Tanzania, and we were correct. 80% of the times. So there is still a margin of errors that we are attributing. So we argue that we do a bit better of what previous literature was doing, but not because the previous literature was making mistakes. It's just that given the fact that our data sets contain battles, basically not just you know, the location of the big conflict, but different battles, it just, if just using the precise location of each battle is not is not gonna make it. So once we are attributing the, uh, the rebel group to the ethnic group, we go back and then now all the conflicts that involve this rebel group are going to be attributed to the Mandingo ethnicity. Okay, is it clear? So, as a measure of political power now, what we, first we need two measures. The first one is going to be kind of, sort of a hands-off measure. We are just taking the ratio of the rank that is provided in the data set. It's gonna be the rank of the rebel group, the ethnic group is not in power over the rank of the group that is in power. This is to make it bilateral, to make it dyadic, but also to give a little bit more of variation to the measure. Because as you can see, if I do not use a relative measure, what happens is that basically I just have three data points, right? I have groups that have either one or two or four. Almost no group has rank of three, and there are just two groups that have rank of five. So the variation in this dependent variable is not going to be that big. Um, this is going, we are going to use this measure uh, because when we first were trying to present proto results with the second measure that now I'm presenting, uh, they told us, why don't you use the measure that you already have? Uh, and so we are gonna use this measure, but of course this measure being a rank. So the first problem it has is that it does not vary that much. But also being a rank is not clear that the, you know, it's not a cardinal measure. So going from one to two is not the same than going from three to four, for example, right? Because from three to four, you start sharing power. From two to three, you're still not in power from discriminated. To, so it's not clear that changing <clears throat> by one, your rank, the, your political power changes linearly. So what we try to do is try to build a more continuous measure of political power. To do that, we followed uh, um, Francois Rainer et Trebi paper on econometrica and tried to collect the ethnicity of cabinet members. So we do this for the 14 countries they selected in their original paper and we extend the period of time that we are considering. In the end, we are considering about 82 uh, groups. So what we do is this. So we take their listing, but their listing is a very comprehensive listing. And so the first thing we need to do is translate their listing of ethnic groups to the EPR listing of, of ethnic groups. And we go through different passages to do that. For the years in which we don't have the data, we go on the CIA, CIFO state cabinet members of foreign government, get the listing of the ministry and try to assign an ethnicity to each of the member of the cabinet. So the first thing we tried to, we hired the array to do that. The first thing was to try to understand if there were direct information on their ethnicity. So sometimes we were lucky. This happened in about 35% of the cases. And this happens usually for ministries that are very important. That are very important and that stayed in office for multiple, office for multiple years. For smaller ministry, we don't have much information on biography, but also if you go on, you know, BBC or other kinds of news, we couldn't find information. So what do we do? We use geomatching again. So we use either the place of birth of the ministry, and if that is not possible, because either it's not reported or the ministry is born abroad, 
or in the capital city, we use either the district of the primary school or the district of the first election of the ministry to attribute an ethnicity. Using geomatching is always nice because then we have low attrition rate. There is some attrition, but in this, with this technique, we are able to uh, give an ethnicity to 94% of the ministry present in those years. So we define relative power now as the number of cabinet members with ethnicity R over the number of cabinet members that have the ethnicity of the government group. So here you have a distribution of this measure. There are a lot of groups that are not represented. And the distribution is quite evenly spread. There are few groups that have a lot of ministries. So having a number equal to one, it means that you have the same number of ministries as the dominant group. So we can debate whether this is a good measure for political power in Africa. Uh, what it's nice is that it ranks similarly to the power index that is already present in the database. So the average number of ministry of different ethnicity decreases with their power rank, which is telling us that maybe it's not the perfect measure of political power, but we are still talking about executive power and it captures something about political power. So now let's go to the juicy stuff. And the juicy stuff is estimation of military power. So we do not have information of military power, nor, nor of ethnic groups, nor or, or rebel groups. So how do we measure military power? It's really, it's really a problem. Previous literature typically tend to use population size of the ethnic group. It didn't sit too well with us and we wanted to improve on uh, this estimation. And we actually spent a couple of years doing that. So we tried to go back to the original definition of what M was in the model, which is the probability of winning a conflict, and then try to estimate this probability of winning the conflict. Of course, we have a lot of challenges. The first one is that we really do need to do a prediction because there has, the majority of ethnic groups did not experience any conflict. It's not that we can use past information to, uh, to predict the probability of the groups. Also groups that do experience conflict have very few information on uh, military power, but we try to exploit the information that we have at the ethnic group level. It's a, there is a wealth of information at the ethnic group level. So what, how do we do it? We try to use machine learning techniques. So we modify an, uh, an algorithm um, by Carolyn Kankel. Uh, this is a, a JPS paper of a couple of years ago. Um, they estimate the probability of winning a conflict using interstate conflict. So they use variables as predictors, military personnel, military expenditure, production of iron and steel, stuff like that. Of course, we don't, want, we don't have those kind of information at uh, the ethnic group level, but we have a lot of information and we have many more data points that we can use. And much as you may know, machine learning techniques works best when the, the, the data matrix is dense, with, there is a lot of data point. So what do we do? So I need to describe really in a couple of words, what is the training set that we use to train the model, how um, and how the model fares, right? How the algorithm works and, do the, and does the model work or not? So the training set, we are going to use conflict of the UCDP jet, but we are going to increase the sample. We are not just using Africa, but we are using Africa and Asia. We have robustness check only using Africa, but the one using also Asia performs better. <clears throat> then to get, have the probability of winning a conflict, we need to know who, which side is actually winning. 
and this information is not present in the, in the civil conflict data set. So what we are going to do is to approximate victory with the number of fatalities. So here we have the distribution of the number of fatalities borne by, um, I think this is the government, and we are kind of discretizing this measure. This is on a log scale, right? So if your side, the government has more than 50% fatalities, then the rebel group wins. <clears throat> We're not making that much of a mistake here, in the sense that, see, the blue one is the discretized version, while I'm not sure if you can see it, but behind you see the, the real uh, number of fatalities, the real fraction of fatalities, and you see in the majority of cases, just one side bears causality, uh, um, fatalities. Then we are going to use all the information that we, can, that we find in the different database as possible predictors. Right, so in the end, we end up with the almost 1,200 conflict events, 175 predictors, and in this training sample, the government group wins 64% of the times. So we are going to use this complex learner, which is based on three different methodologies. Two methodologies that are three-based, so non-parametric methodologies, which is a collection of random forms and a collection of boosted decision trees, and complemented with a generalized, generalized linear model, so kind of reach lasso type regressions. So we are going to run many of these models, and then there is a super learner that picks the weights to give to different models to choose which predictor are going to best predict the probability of winning, re minimizing the cross-validation error. So you probably understood immediately that this is not what I did in the paper, this is not my contribution in the paper, but just to give you an idea, each time we have to run this algorithm, even if the observations are not that many, it takes two to three days to run each time the algorithm. So it's kind of a complex algorithm on a server. So how does it fare, this algorithm? Well, not bad, actually. So the, um, the measure uh, that we use to um, look at the performance of these machine learning techniques is the reduction in the cross-validated log loss. So an ideal model that is perfect would have a log loss equal to zero. Uh, so the smaller the log loss, the better is the model. The uh, proportional reduction in the cross-validated log loss is how much the model improves compared to a model with no predictors, a null model. So our full model improves, have a reduction in the validated log loss of 20%, which is similar to what Carolyn Kankel finds for interstate, interstate conflict. And given the variables that we are going that we are using, which are you know nightlight population, these are the, the ethnic relating relationship of the groups and geographical characteristic and land use. I mean, compared to the information they have for uh, nation and state conflict, I, I would say that you are actually faring pretty well. Here I'm also reporting how um, a simple model just predicts using either population or night, light, um, night lights as a measure of wealth and income of uh, the group fares. So you see, if we just use simple models, and predict probability of winning either with the share of population or night light, we are not really doing much better than you know, tossing a coin at a 64% probability of say that the government win. Here I'm just plotting the predicted M for groups that are in conflict and for groups that are not in conflict. This is just to show that they do overlap. So it's not that I'm estimating the military, military power to be very high for only for groups that are in conflict. Because if then I want to use it to predict the probability of entering a conflict and only groups that are in conflict have high military power, then I'm just basically feeding in the, the answer that I want to the data. The, the second thing we try to do is try to validate our outcome variable. So again, this is very difficult. I, this is my first time working with conflict data. 
And I discovered that, you know, when we work with trade data, we are extremely lucky. Um, so basically there are no data set that have uh, that have civil conflict, that have the number of fatality and also reports the outcome of the, of the conflict. The only one that has this information is the correlates of war data set. It's just that reports this information uh, for 163 conflicts. What I'm doing as a suggestive evidence is to show you that if we use, if we predict the outcome using the ratio of fatalities, we are correct about 80% of the time. So there is a correlation between who is bearing more uh, casualties and who is winning or losing the conflict. So it seems reasonable, but we do robustness check on it. We rerun the, data, the, the algorithm using relative number of fatalities, for example, the fatalities of the population of the ethnic group. Uh, we, instead of using a dichotomous measure of victory, just use the number of fatalities. Or if you don't really like uh, the interpretation of the number of fatalities as an outcome of the conflict, just think now of them as the probability of you know, having less casualties uh, or in, during a conflict. Uh, I, I really cannot do better than this to validate uh, um, the, the ratio of fatality as a proxy of the outcome of the conflict. This slide that, that I'm going to skim through is just to show that the algorithm is very robust. So we can tweak all the different parameters that we can manage, that you can uh, choose in the algorithm process, in the optimization process, the number of faults, the number of trees, the, the velocity of learner of the, of the algorithm, but the prediction are extremely correlated with each other. Of course, when uh, we use machine learning techniques, the pros is that they typically improve accuracy in prediction. The cons is that we cannot really say what is impacting this uh, probability of winning the conflict. What are the variables that are actually relevant to predict this probability of winning the conflict? It's a sort of a black box and <clears throat> we as economists don't like black box too much. So, what we try to do to understand which are the key variables in explaining this probability of winning the conflict in our model, we rerun the algorithm multiple times and exclude sets of variables. <coughs> and here we show the changes in the performance of the algorithm. The idea is that the more the performance worsens, the, most in, the more important those sets of variables are in explaining the probability of winning. So you see the country level characteristic do not matter that much for the performance of the algorithm. So in explaining the probability of victory, conflict characteristic matter. This is PS of um, um, years and the war history. So how many times the group have been in conflict before and since when the group is not uh, is at peace. Then we have the external support variables that are also very important. These are variables that tell us whether the group had alliances with third parties outside the country that were supporting it. Supporting meaning either giving um, weapons, uh, funds, or helping with logistics. Then we have population that is also important. I think our relationship matters, but not that much. Remember that here I cannot say what is the direction of the impact. So it could be that this year enters negatively to predict victory and external power enters positively. I, I cannot say uh, how these different variables influence the probability of winning. I can just say that some of them are more important than others in predicting the probability of winning. Okay. So with that, armed with this piece of information, we try to build two measures of this power mismatch. The first one is a mismatch dummy, which is a dummy variable that is going to be one if using the political power index, the group has high political power and low military power or vice versa. Right? So it's a dummy that is telling me where high and low are defined with quartiles of the distributions. This is just telling me it's mismatched or not. 
or we can go closer to the definition of in the model and define the continuous version of the mismatch as the difference between the, probability, the estimated probability of winning a conflict and the ratio between the number of cabinet members of the, of the group vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government group. This we can do just for 14, the 14 countries for which we have the continuous measure of mismatch. <coughs> So this was the bulk of the contribution of the paper. And now what I'm going to do is to show you some descriptive evidence, uh, not causal evidence. So I'm going to show some correlations. So the first thing we do is just to have correlation with different sets of fixed effect using the mismatch dummy. And this is telling us that mismatch is positively correlated with the probability of being in a conflict. And specifically, if a group that is mismatched is 20 percentage points more like, likely to be in, at war, which is huge. This, this number is huge. So for sure, there are some endogeneity problems here. Uh, this number is telling us that the probability of being in a conflict doubles if the country is mismatched. Interestingly, though, the size of the coefficient is very stable. And I'm showing column one, two, one and two just to see, to show you that the correlation is there, even if, if the simple correlation is there. But given how I estimated the military power, we need to have in the regression country times year fixed effect. So this is the um, probability, this military power estimate, so the probability of winning a conflict is estimated dialectically. So the probability that each rebel group has vis-a-vis -vis the government group. So I cannot use it to make cross-country comparison, right? So I cannot use the, up, the, um, the absolute value of this number to say that the group in Congo is more or less strong than the group in Liberia, because it's always vis-a-vis -vis its own government group. So it's important, and since the government group can change through time, it's important to have country year fixed effect. Uh, in column four, I'm actually identifying, identifying. <laughs> I'm actually showing the correlation using a different source of variation. So here I'm including group by group fixed effect, which means that I'm just considering groups that, of course, enters into conflict. So these are groups that have and don't have conflict and that change the, the value of the dummy. So I'm identifying here only a few observations in the sample. And in the final regression, I'm having both count year fixed effect and group fixed effect. And luckily, the size of the coefficient is very stable. In the second table, we are trying to understand whether this mismatch variable, mismatch dummy, is correlated with other factors, other controls that in the literature have been shown to affect conflict, the probability of conflict. So we are controlling for this years whether the ethnic group in different, the same ethnic group in different countries has power or not, it increases its power rank, is in conflict or not, whether the natural resources of the group, these are time bearing, these are discoveries of gold field, um, mines, diamond, gems, and oil. Then we have geographic controls and example economic controls. So these are going to be land use, night lights, population, uh, latitude, longitude, uh, um, distance from the border, distance from the capital, basically. These are interacted with trends, but it's uh, completely irrelevant whether I put the trends or not put the trends or, put, or in interacted with the dummies. So we do see that when I have all the controls together, the size of the coefficient like goes down quite a bit. And it seems that you know, the economic costs are the ones that are eating away, uh, that are correlated with this mismatch dummy. Then 
What about the mismatch dummy when I use the continuous version instead of the uh, dummy variable? So this now is us for 14 countries for which I have the continuous measure of political power and the mismatch now is built in the model as the absolute value of the difference between military and political power. Again, the size of the effect seems similar, but in this, this group has a higher average of conflict. So the effect here now is not doubling, but increasing by 30%, the probability. An increase in one star the deviation increased by about two percentage points. So the effect is much smaller in this, uh, in this uh, um, 14 country sample with the linear version of the mismatch. But it's still, we see that it seems true that groups that are in conflict, that participate into conflicts tend to be more mismatched. I'm also including the interaction of the mismatch variable with a dummy that tells me whether the group has military power that is greater than the political power. And we see that this doesn't seem to really make a difference. And this may be because we don't really observe who is initiating the conflict. Because we too thought that you know, what was important was having M greater than P and not just the absolute value of the difference. But armed with the continuous measure, we can play around a bit. So for example, we, here we show that the relation between power mismatch and probability of going to conflict is nonlinear. So for these are, these are three, the size of the distribution of mismatch uh, in different groups. We see that increasing the mismatch for groups that are, that are at low level of mismatch does not, is not correlated with conflict, while for groups that have already high mismatch, the correlation is positive and significant. And indeed, if we provide a uh, non-parametric estimation of this relationship, we see that it is convex. A simple explanation of this would be that in, in all these cases, remember that in the model we had the, the difference, the absolute value of the difference between M and P should be smaller than the cost of conflict. And so it could be that here the cost of conflict is still too high. So increasing the mismatch a bit is not enough to increase the chances that you are in conflict, that you will start a conflict. But for intermediate level, it's the case that the higher is the mismatch, the more it's probable that groups are participating in the conflict. So we, since we have this information on the type of conflicts, we can show that indeed the mismatch does not seem relevant or is not correlated with conflict for small conflicts. So these are conflicts that have in a year less than 25 deaths. And here, mismatch does not seem to play a role, while it is correlated with big companies, so companies that have more than 25 deaths. It also seems that it is more relevant for conflict which grievances have to do with central power. So we do have a distinction in the database that tells us whether it is a territorial conflict, so either a conflict for a secession or for more autonomy in the management of the territory, or it is a centrist conflict, meaning that either you want to change the government to change the composition or really a sort of coup d'etat in which you really want to change the group that is in power. And it seems that this mismatch is correlated with centrist conflict. In a way, it squares quite well with the theory. Also, because for territorial conflict, something like preferences may be more important. It's not maybe it's maybe it's not the mismatch of power that matters, but the fact that really I don't want to stay in a union with you, but I want my own county and my own autonomy. Finally, there is a prediction in Massimo's model that tells us that the higher is the mismatch, the longer should be the duration of the conflict. The, so groups have incentive to you know, fight and hear more. So we see here I, it's, a, it's really you know, preliminary and super suggestive evidence. So these are just few conflicts, for a few conflicts for which I have um, uh, complete data. And uh, this is a survival function. So the failure here is that conflict ends. 
this is basically the number of conflicts that ends after one year, two years, three years. The dotted line has groups that have mismatched below the um, median, and the um, solid line is groups that have mismatched above the median. And so, but for one group which is still in conflict, so for all the all the periods in our data set, the group has been in conflict. You see, it goes beyond 20, it goes at 20. Uh, on average, we can see the group that have higher mismatch tend to be involved in longer conflict. We can actually reject the fact that the two uh, functions are the same. But I mean, this is really just suggestive evidence. So what I what we try to do with this paper is to you know, provide a new data set that tell, and a new measure of military power at the ethnic group level and try to test the mismatch theory with it. So try to put it in a workable fashion and see if we can say, if we can use uh, these measures in a meaningful way. We try to provide some preliminary suggestive evidence that mismatch seems to be correlated with conflict. More, the relationship is nonlinear, is correlated more with big conflict and centrist conflict, which seems to be in line with the theory. And for the future, and if you have suggestion, I would be incredibly happy to take them. Uh, we need now to work a bit more on the identification strategy. So I, I would love to say that, you know, an increase in the mismatch causes an increase of the probability of conflict by X percent. Uh, at this stage, we, we still haven't find, found, you know, the perfect instrument of a you know, smart, super smart way of doing it. But this is going to be, you know, the, the next step, try to find some exogenous uh, sources of variation to make it a little, a little bit, at least a little bit more exogenous. So I hope I convinced you a bit and I and I really would be extremely happy to have whatever suggestion, comments. Uh, you are also free to tell me that you really didn't like it. And, uh, you know, I have to change a lot of things. So thank you so much for your time and I'll shut up. Thanks a lot, Laura. Uh, yeah, so everyone feel free to jump in. I mean, I, there's a lot of careful, detailed, long work you've done, obviously. I think you uh, were super cautious at the beginning. Uh, um, uh, there's a lot more than you, than you promised. I think, one another way to push the empirics short of finding some exogenous or um, sort of quasi uh, natural experiment would be to push the controls as much as possible you know whenever one can come up with a concern about omitted variables if you can come up with a with a control um, that would be another way to push for instance um, i mean one obvious thing is the source of um, power mismatch, right? What are what are the sources of these historically, geographically, and what is the probability that that's kind of driving both conflict and mismatch at the same time? Um, I don't know, like for instance, kind of tangentially related to this topic, but just in terms of the data and the variation, James Fenske had has this well cited paper on how resource asymmetry in Africa is related to state formation, ethnic uh, relations, sort of group uh, 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 interactions with, within ethnic groups in Africa. So in the same vein, if you can look at maybe using the FAO Gaes data about fertility of land or well-known resources that are tied to location um, that can be associated with an ethnicity, see whether Sort of as a resource asymmetry is related both to power asymmetry as well as conflict then right they can cause conflict for various reasons to grab the other one's better land or some mineral um a resource that could be one thing that i can think think of um marius yeah hi um okay uh very interesting i there's a problem there's my camera um question one thing that surprised me is this seeming symmetry in this uh, the effect of the mismatch irrespective of its sign um 
you know, I would expect there to be much more potential for conflict if you have a non-represented group that is militarily strong than the other way around. So you went over this pretty quickly. Could you tell us a little bit how you make sense of that result? So that's an extremely good question. So that regression, will, I'm, I'm not even sure the result is gonna actually stay because I'm getting new estimates of this military power, hopefully today or tomorrow. But um, yeah, I too was expecting that what really mattered was when the Mises military power was bigger than the political power. Uh, otherwise, why the group should rebel? So the, pro the problem here is that to test this theory correctly, I should need, I, I would need to have uh, who initiates the conflict. So it could also be that since there are, we also have like smaller conflicts and we have really lots of conflict, it could be that, you know, we have some repression conflicts or longer conflicts because here, so the event, it could be a question of how the data is built. So the data set is battle-based basically, event-based. So since the ethnic data is ethnic group here, we are kind of, you know, aggregating up all the conflict that belongs to that ethnic group against the government in that year, right? But it, and the conflict tend to last multiple periods. So usually conflict does not last one year, but there are multi conflict that are kind of also low intensity conflict in which you have one battle in one year and then for two years you don't have battles and then you have another battle in one year. So it could also be that, you know, there, there is this go back and forth between government forces and rebel forces inside of a big, uh, you know, cleavage, a big uh, controversy, and they meet with armies every once in a while. And one, once the government wins, the other times the rebel group wins. So it's not obvious that uh, uh, the conflict that I see is because the, the, the rebel group actually initiated the conflict because they wanted more power. A second possibility could also be due to the fact that, so by now I don't have exogenous variation, right? So nobody's telling me that so I can use lag of my mismatch variables, whatever. But I mean, these mismatch variables, since they are built on, on the on the one hand, political power is election, as, you know, changes when the cabinet changes. So in Africa, surprisingly, the members do not change. There is not that much of a turnover in some countries. So the military power is estimated by characteristic that also do not have that much of a time variation. So when I put in relative population sizes or night lights, it's not that they are jumping up and down, right? So it mismatches that, uh, that mismatch that I estimate, it doesn't vary that much over time. And it could vary as a response of the government, of, of the conflict. So that's that's my, my actual, let's say, problem with this kind of work that, you know, conflict may happen precisely because you want to change power, then the power changes, and then I have maybe a, some mismatch changes as a response to the conflict. So if the conflict lasts multiple periods, this is problematic, right? So I have conflict and power changes, and this stuff, then these groups are still in conflict. Uh, when I put maybe in group fixed effect, this is uh, more muted, but still the fact that relevant group changes over time, what are the things that are making my mismatch changes change? So this could be the data construction. That's why I was like really trying to focus on the data construction because you guys are all, you know, used to work with this kind of you know, empirical data and have clear in mind all the empirical problems that we can have. Uh, and when I talk with political scientists, it's like they, they don't care about the exogenous variation that much. <laughs> they are more on the theory part. Uh, but I was not like I'm trying to kind of try to exit this circularity of what influence what, how can I make it uh, exogenous? How can I find a source of exogenous variation? Because we were thinking, so along the lines, along the lines of what Karen suggested, we were thinking of using something historical, like maybe for colonies, we can see which ethnic group got the power when the, the, the colonial period ended. And this group tend to have an advantage at least initially. But then how do I make it time varying? Another possibility is using, we were thinking yeah, of using the co-ethnic relationship. 
So this would be maybe also along the lines of, you know, the Alizina paper, the one that, that the groups that are split uh, in weird way during the economic, the, during the, colon, the colonial period. And so you have maybe strong co-ethnics around that may help you or may, they, they go to power, they come to power and this improves your military power, your military strength, because now you have co that can help you. And this has nothing to do with what's happening inside your own country. Maybe, I don't know if it's, if it's true. Another possibility we were toying with was using the fall of the USSR with the idea that some of the governments in Africa were allied with um, the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union fell, this meant a reduction in the military power of all these government groups, uh, which again, shouldn't uh, be immediately correlated with what was going on within the country before the fall of the USSR. Um, so th this is what came up to our mind by now, but I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, great, thank you. I mean, it's obviously very, complicated to tease up causal effect. I, I will see the end of this paper sooner or later. <laughs> Thanks. I think there was uh, one more question. Alessandra, did I see your hand raise? Hi, yeah, I had a question, but I guess we are uh, close to the end, so I, I will have a... Uh... Why don't you go ahead and we finish with that? Yeah, no, it was just a suggestion. As uh, you all know, I'm far away from this literature. I, I was thinking about the, the cost of waging conflict, mm -hmm. which, uh, as I got in the toy model, is symmetric. What if this is not symmetric? And uh, if there is some, uh, you know, at least a cost of opportunity cost, different opportunity cost between the two groups in waging war. And it's, if it's something that is uh, unobserved and can uh, explain perhaps your uh, convexity or- Right, a bit like the things. cost of, you know, exporting and stuff like this in which you can exploit- Yes, yes, costs. yes. And, and in that case, in that yeah. case, following the literature on trade and war, uh, you may also have some, use some trade data, perhaps internal trade data or, you know, proximity of the, uh, of the ethnic group to, to a port or this kind of thing. Right. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's actually- It was uh, just, you know, um, yeah. ideas you. from uh, out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks you so a lot. Much. Thank you for your time and I hope you will have a good summer holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Laura and everyone. Uh, Looking forward to see the paper develop, and uh, so we conclude. Yeah, let's let's give Laura and everyone a hand with that, um, and hope to continue in future years. Ciao. Bye. Thank you so bye much. Bye. Bye.